Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is our second lecture on uh, quantum information and quantum computation, and it's done by Simba. Uh, just have a minor announcement. I didn't uh, upload this week yet because I've been really busy, <laughs> and um, I'm going to finish it tomorrow. Um, I will be doing representation theory, and I will finish off um, basically the reason why it's been taking so long because I was doing some code in Mathematica and it's and I've been fixing that a little bit, but I, but I finished it, so I, I I will record it tomorrow. So I will hand the mic to Simba right now. Uh, Simba. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh. Yeah. Go. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Lee. So um, as we mentioned from our last week's um lecture, I guess um, like this week we're going to talk about the basics and postulates in quantum mechanics that is useful for quantum information. Uh, we will not talk about everything like um, hydrogen atom perturbation theorem. Like we will not touch about that. I think Lee would go on for, uh, uh, yeah, his lectures in like mathematical foundations for quantum mechanics. So I uh, will just go through very useful things. So um, the outline today is I will go through the four postulates in quantum mechanics and also a very useful thing to um, distinguish between pure state and mixed state, which is a density operator and give you a sense of the uh, EPR pairs or Bell states, which is very useful in quantum information. Cool. And the references are the same, like uh, the uh, same free textbooks like I used last week, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so let's go right into the first one, postulate one. So quantum mechanics is basically uh, people before do not understand quantum mechanics very well. Like people think quantum mechanics is like, Probably, yeah, because we developed like classical physics before, right? So the postulates of quantum mechanics were derived after a long process of trial and error. So basically, we just try all different things, and then we formulate a mathematical model for that. And then we do experiments, see if the ex uh, experimental result matches with our um, mathematical model. So that is basically how we derived the postulates and how it derived quantum mechanics in modern days, right? So uh, which involve a considerable guessing and basically guessing and like orient orienter of the theory. So the first postulate of quantum mechanics sets up the arena in which the quantum mechanics take place. And the arena is our old friend, um, Hilbert space, as we discussed last week. Okay, so the formulation of the first postulate is like associated to any isolated physical system in a complex vector space, basically Hilbert space, uh, with inner products, known as the state space of the system. And the system is completely described by its state vector, which is a unit vector in the uh, system's state space. So there are several very important ideas in this postulate. I'll uh, talk about it in the next page. Yes, so basically it must be an isolated physical system. Um, which like we believe our universe itself is an isolated like system. And uh, there's a Hilbert space corresponding to the system where your physical state lives in. And the state vector completely describes the um, state of the thing that the thing lives in the vector space. So a very uh, naive example or a very like um, not totally correct example is like suppose we have an electron in state phi cat phi and this state is completely de described the electron's property in the Hilbert space it lives in uh which includes but not limited to like the location of the electron the momentum the energy uh the spin of the electron uh the food the electron enjoys the movie that the electron like and whether the electron is married or not well you know it's a joke but like it basically the state cat uh, cat phi uh, includes every information you can think of of the electron. So this is the first postulate. But wait a minute, maybe you have your you have in mind that wait. So by probably you heard about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you cannot determine the location and the uh, momentum of the electron simultaneously, right? Uh, so how how can like of say cat plus? Oh, sorry, cat phi. Um, include the information of both information of location and information of momentum. The thing is, like, if you want to determine something, you need to do a measurement on the state. And doing the measurement will affect the state. If I <clears throat> will affect the state, um, basically, we'll talk about it in uh, probably 10 minutes. So you can bear in mind. But like for now, 
the postulate is like what we have. Um, basically, the state vector phi describes everything about the states. Cool. So um, quantum mechanics does not tell us, like for a given physical system, what state space the system is. And yeah, basically, like this is only a postulate, and they do not tell you what the state is. For example, a qubit, uh, where it's like actually a two lives in a two dimensional Hilbert space, and one set of the possible uh, state cat uh, state vectors is uh, zero and one. So, uh, for example, electron spin, you know, like electron is a spin one half particle. Oh, if you know what I'm saying that you know, but if you don't know, you can watch like Lee's video on quantum mechanics. I think he will talk about it. But yeah, so electron is a spin one half particle. So it can either spin up or spin down. So the spin of the electron forms a two dimensional vector space, a uh, Hilbert space uh, to be specific, uh, with only two possible state vectors, uh, cat plus, oh, sorry, cat, up or cap down. So basically you can describe cap one or cap zero. Yes. And also the important thing is you require the vector to be normalized, meaning that the inner product of the vector with itself is one. Uh, this is usually called the normalization condition for the state vectors. Uh, and this is important uh, when we go into the third postulate, the quantum measurement, and you will see why this is important. Cool. So uh, the second postulate, uh, of the quantum mechanics is to describing how the quantum system evolved with time. So the evolution of a closed quantum system is described by a unitary transformation. Uh, a unitary transformation, I would do, uh, I would like explain a bit later. That is the state cat phi of the system at time t1 is related to the state cat phi of the system at time t2 by a unitary operator u which depends only on time t1 and t2. Basically, phi, phi prime equals to u times phi. So a unitary operator uh, is a bounded linear operator from a Hilbert space to another Hilbert space. Oh, sorry, this definition is a, a bit too mathematical. Basically, uh, the dagger, the uh, permission conjugate of the uh, unitary operator times itself is equals to the identity operator, which means that um, the inverse of the operator is the Hermitian conjugate of the uh, of the um, operator. So, uh, what why is it so important that we need a unitary operator? Because we want uh, something called like a back thing. So, so basically, it goes two ways. So, uh, for example, uh, if you're evolving with positive time for ten seconds, and you apply a unitary to that, which is a uh, applying it to uh, propagating to minus time, which is not possible in our real life for 10 seconds, you should get back the initial state, something like it. So uh, basically, yes, you, we are requiring a unitary operator. And of course, quantum mechanics didn't tell us how to construct the unitary operator, uh, but we know the construction, but for some special states and for some special state space, but I don't think we know the general construction. Uh yeah, if we if I'm wrong, like just correct me, right? Leave. Thank you. He is so smart. Okay, so <laughs> actually, uh, the postulate two can be uh refined. If you see our previous postulate two, it's like t one and t two are two discrete time, right? So uh, like the postulate stated here is like for discrete time, but actually we can make it continuous time, if you're making T1 and T2 arbitrarily close to each other, and there's arbitrarily many um, time instants. So we can redefine the positive two to uh, what we call a Schrodinger equation. Yeah, so the time evolution of the state of a closed quantum system is described by the Schrodinger equation. So IH bar d phi dt equals to H times phi. So the H bar is the reduced Planck constant which is determined experimentally. Um, I forgot the exact value. You can look it up online. It's like very, very, very commonly used in physics, right? Okay. And H is the her uh, Hamiltonian operator. Uh, it is a Hermitian, which gives the energy of the states. So basically it's an energy operator. And after you get the measurement, you got you make the state into an energy eigenstate, basically. So um, by doing this, then uh, you can easily solve 
uh, for like the evolution operator for um, the thing. Basically, um, if you're uh, assuming some properties, you can show that like the uh, unit tree is uh, e to the power minus i h bar, uh, i h bar, i over h bar, h not t or something. Yeah, you can show it. So basically this is um, the Schrodinger equation. Yeah, so in general, figure out the Hamiltonian needed to describe a particular system is very difficult in the problem of quantum mechanics because that's how, uh, that is what quantum mechanics study of. But for some system, we do know the Hamiltonian, for example, like hydrogen atom, right? Uh, and <clears throat> where E, so basically you can do um, um, spectral decomposition. Wait, I'm too, a bit too fast. Yeah, so uh, a good news is like most of the time in our discussion of quantum computation and quantum information, we don't need to discuss the Hamiltonian in detail. Uh, but if you're doing a mathematical theory of quantum mechanics, like what Leaf's doing, then uh, then you're like, you might need to figure out the Hamiltonians. So even if we do, we can use the spectral decomposition of the Hamiltonians. Basically, you can decompose the Hamiltonian using the completeness relation uh, to write it as the energy times the energy eigenstates, or the like, um, I don't know how to call it, the Yi, Cat, uh, and Bra Yi, yeah, basically. So uh, the E is the energy eigenvalue and cat E is the energy eigenstates or sometimes called the stationary states because the um, things stay in the energy eigenstates should not change. However, this is not entirely true. Okay, so what I'm going to say for the next two minutes is not related to uh, quantum information. It's related to quantum field theory, which I just learned it like on Tuesday, uh, if you're like, if you can't understand what I'm saying or if it's too like um, misleading, you can just like skip it, okay. So the thing is like, suppose you know for a hydrogen atom, right, Leaf, if suppose you're a hydrogen atom, then, uh, you know, like suppose that electron of a hydrogen atom is in an excited state, what will you do? I'm asking, like, Leaf, do you think? Oh, yeah, it's me. Sorry, sorry. Give yeah, me a second. Uh, can, did you say if the electron is in the excited state of yeah. the hydrogen atom, what it will do? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, so ground state is 13.6 EV and then excited. So it's in the outer one higher orbital of the of the hydrogen atom. Yeah. Is that what uh, you mean? Is that is that your question? Like I don't know. I don't know. Like like yeah, the, you... the question is like, you know, for excited state electrons, mm -hmm. uh, they act mm -hmm. we tends to go back to the ground state and emit. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it'll emit right. uh it's like it's like emission processes, right? It's like yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But according to what I've written on the slide, um electron, sorry, uh the eigenstates of energy eigenstates are sometimes called the stationary state. They should mm -hmm. not change with time. Oh, okay. But basically, what? if you have an electron in mm. single particle quantum mechanics, if you have an electron in an excited state, it should stay in the excited state for however long, because the excited state are also the energy eigenstates. Uh, you don't and mind if I ask a question, right? Yeah, um, But that's only the case if your Hamiltonian is not time dependent, right? If you add time, right. I don't, yeah, I see. Okay, okay. I see exactly. where you're going. Okay, okay. I see where yeah, you're going. Right, exactly. <laughs> So, um, but in hydrogen atom, uh, or if we like there in the universe, there's only one hydrogen atom, the Hamiltonian should not be time dependent, right? Because like you should have the time symmetry. That's why we say single particle quantum mechanics is problematic. Uh, mm -hmm. Although to a very good description, uh, like the length scale is greater than a Bohr magneton or something. Uh, it is a good approximation, but uh, in a very small time scale, for example, like what we're introducing here is an example that the uh, quantum single particle quantum mechanics does not hold. So we need a better theory, uh, basically relativistic quantum mechanics, or you can call it quantum field theory. Yes. I see. I see. Um, All right. That's that's interesting. Still, All right. Yeah, I'm still learning, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So uh, forget what I've just talked about. Okay. Let's go on. Yeah. Basically, um, you can do a spectral decomposition, and uh, in the hydrogen atom, very nicely, you can show the evolution of the quantum state E or the say, stationary state E to be like here, right? So uh, it will evolve to exponential minus i e t over h bar times the original like state. I, I have a small question. Sorry. Yes. Um, go on. 
this equation that you show, um, for the cat E, it's only in the E basis, right? You can change the basis to something else, like like the X yes, or P. Exactly. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. No, no. It's just a small question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, as we mentioned, the uh cat E by postulate one, it it already have all the information of the states, but uh, the thing is in a energy eigenstate, it's basically if you use a Hamiltonian operator acting on the state, the uh, you can only, you can get the energy of the state and do not and you you wouldn't affect the energy eigenstate, but the energy eigenstate is not the position eigenstate, meaning that if you act a position operator or a momentum operator, what is momentum operator uh commute with Hamiltonian? Whatever. So generally, if you like, position operator should not be. So if you add a position operator on the cat E, uh, you will probably get something of position, but you will change the cat E to some other state because cat E is only a energy eigenstate, but it's not a position eigenstate. So you would change the position. Yes. So change the po change the state of the system. Basically, measurement will make your uh system change a little bit. I'll talk about more more about it in next section, which is exactly the quantum measurement, the postulate three. Okay, so postulate three provides a means for describing the effect of measurement on quantum system. You know, like um, basically, uh, although we are saying that all the postulate one and two, uh, are true for a closed system, but somehow you would like to interact with the quantum system, right? So here's why we have the third postulate. So quantum measurements are described by a collection of uh, M, M, uh, basically it's a measurement operator. And these are operators acting on the state space of a system being measured. And the index small m refers to the measurement outcome that may occur in the experiment. And if the state of the quantum system is phi, cat phi immediately before the measurement, then the probability that the measurement result m occurs is given by uh, basically the cat uh, the bra phi times the m dagger m times the cat phi. Yeah, it's basically a postulate. Um, this is what we call the uh probability uh density, right? This is the probability density, or you can write the probability amplitude by uh, just like phi phi and uh square. Yeah probably empathy, but this is the probability density already. Um, yes, so the state of the system after the measurement is actually changed to the eigenstate of the um, measurement operator M with corresponding to a measurement result of small m. And, but you need to redo the normalization condition. Otherwise, see, here's why we need the uh, normalization because otherwise the summation of all the possibility for getting all the result M would be greater than one, which is not possible, right? In math, we know like the total probability should be one. So you need to do a normalization after each time you do a measurement or like doing the calculation, basically. And the measurement operator satisfy the completeness relation, basically summation M dagger M equals to uh, I, meaning that uh, the probability of getting all uh, getting all result is sum up, sum up to one. So basically you will at least get a result and you will not get two results. Um, this is make sense, right? Yeah. So um, the observable is in the form of M dagger M because we want it to be Hermitian. Uh, this, uh, Hermitian operator is good because it have, as we mentioned in the last class, it have like a pos, sorry, it has a um, real eigenvalues and its eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. So wanted to be Hermitian. And also the completeness relation states that the sum of the probability of getting an outcome is one. Yeah, basically. Cool. So um, there is a special class of measurement that is used commonly in physics or in quantum mechanics or in quantum information. It's called the projective measurement. So a projective measurement is described by an observable M. Uh, wait, should we... Uh, Ob uh, yeah, observable M, uh, which is a Hermitian operator on the state space of a system being observed. And the observable has a spectral decomposition of M equal to the summation of tiny M times PM. So the PM is the projector onto an eigenspace of M, which with eigenvalue is small m. So the possible outcome of the measurement corresponding to the eigenvalues M 
of the observable. So basically it means that maybe this is more familiarized with physicists, like this definition is more a physicist, physicist um, definition. So basically it means like upon measuring the state cat phi, the probability of getting uh, the measurement outcome of small m is given by the bra, uh, bra phi pm cat phi, basically, yes. So this is the uh, probability amplitude. Oh, I think it's, it should be squared, sorry. Yeah, there should be a square uh, to make it a probability density, uh, whatever. And the state of the uh, quantum system immediately after the measurement is basically changed to one of the eigenstate of the measurement uh, measurement projector operator PM. Yeah, basically projector uh, uh, measurement is what we commonly use in quantum information science. I think there should be a, uh, wait, should there be a square here for the probability density? I just copied from the book, but probably it's like a typo. Yeah, I would double check. and I, I don't know as well. I, I'm not sure. I, wait, uh, let, me think. Uh, let me think as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. Wait, is um, this the probability or the probability density? This is, should be the probability. So you should have a square, right? I think it should be squared then if it's probability. It needs okay, to be squared. So, yeah. I think so. so uh, I mean, um, if it's a mistake, we can correct it later. I mean, yeah. But, okay, but you okay. can check now. Check now is also is also okay. I mean, if you want to. Yeah, probably let's not delay Waste. too much. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just rem if it is, then just remember it's supposed to be squared, you know? Right, right. Yeah. So either square or not square, but like yeah. you got the probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You check the dimension. Dude, can you check that? No, you, can no, you cannot. Probability is like a constant, so you cannot. Because it's dimensionless, you know. It's like <laughs> yeah, right. So, anyway, <laughs> let's go to the next page. Um, yeah, I learned it from like a university professor at Oxford. It's like uh, when you're giving a lecture, uh, the least thing you want to do is to question your what have you written on your like uh notes or on your slides. It's basically oh, you might think oh, I might made a mistake, but beforehand when you're preparing you have much longer time to like do the thing so you might not make a mistake but it's just like at the spot you think you made a mistake it's like so you should trust whatever you write on the thing okay whatever cool so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh the commonly heard version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh by a second year physicist is probably like delta x delta px is greater than h bar over two right but there's a more mathematically way, a mathematical way to state the same thing. It's like the mathematical way to state uh, is that if we prepare a large number of quantum systems in identical states, uh, and the state is kept fine, and then we perform a measurement C on some of those states and measurement D in the others, then the standard deviation delta C of the uh, of the operator C uh, results times uh, multiply the standard deviation of the measurement result D uh, will give you a uh, will and like the multiplication of this two will satisfy the inequality delta C delta D is greater than uh, basically the commutator D uh, the uh, the mean value no the expected value of the commutator of the D over two so uh, this can be mathematically proven, which is not hard. You can look up any textbook and I, I'm sure there will be uh, the proof of Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So one common example is like uh, delta X delta BX is greater than H bar for two because the, uh, the commutator between the location operator and the momentum operator is IH bar. So yeah, basically got the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yeah, and next, uh, I would like to talk about the positive operator value measurement or POVM. It is very important in quantum computation because like basically every measurement we are done are a POVM. So suppose a measurement is described by a measurement operator MM uh, and is performed upon a quantum system in the state cat plus, uh, sorry, cat phi, then the probability of an outcome, uh, as we mentioned before, is PM equals to the, uh, Bra phi m dagger m cat phi. It's basically the uh, expected value for uh, m dagger m. Yeah. So suppose we define an operator called E m, which is equals to m dagger m. Then E small m is a positive operator such that the summation of E equals to one uh, or uh, identity operator. So it satisfies the um, 
complete in the simulation. And also the probability of uh, probability of measuring M is basically phi EM phi. So you can you can just think about EM as a projective operator. Actually, a projective operator is an example of the positive operator value measurement or P of EM. Yes. So um uh, the operator EM is known as a POVM element associated with the measurement, and the complete set uh, EM is going to be a POVM, basically. Um, this is a definition of POVM. And cool, let's come to our last postulate of composite system, uh, of quantum mechanics, which is talking about the composite system, as we mentioned a little bit already last week. So suppose we are interested in a composite system which made up of two or more distinct physical system and the state space of a composite system, a composite physical system is the tensor product of the tensor space of the component physical systems. Moreover, if we have system numbered one to N and the system number I is prepared in cat <clears throat> in state cat uh, phi I, then the joint state of the total system is basically cat one tensor product cat two tensor product blah, 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 tensor product cat n. Yeah, it's basically what what we have talked about last week. So um, I do have a question to all of you, uh, if you're watching the video or leave probably. So can all composite system uh, be written as the tensor product of the state in each individual system? I uh, give the answer. I should like next time. I should make it a complete just... slide. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so you might, <clears throat> yeah, from the previous definition, probably you think yes. Why? Why not? Like I can write, uh, what the system, uh, what the state of the system one is tensor product. What the state of the system two is then give you like a thing. But actually, we cannot. Uh, it is one of the very important concepts in quantum mechanics as the quantum entanglement. Uh, and quantum entanglement is the ultimate thing that we have that we can do quantum information in. So basically, if without quantum entanglement, then like quantum system would just be the same as classical system, in at least in terms of like information science. So um, uh, a, a story about it is like... Uh, uh, when I think that's when like the people develop quantum mechanics, people do not believe there's a quantum entanglement. So Einstein and Robinson and I'm uh, no, not Robinson, EPR, like the free guy. Uh, uh Dolsky and Rosen. Yeah. Yeah, Norsky Dolsky and Rosen. And, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't have I don't know how to pronounce. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and the free guy, which I will talk about a bit more about later, do not agree that there is quantum entanglement. And they propose a experiment to show that uh, entanglement does not occur. But uh, Bell did an experiment and show, wow, actually we do have the entanglement. So which like, which makes me have a job because I'm studying quantum mechanics. <laughs> so yeah, quantum entanglement is very important. So a very simple example is suppose you have a two system quantum states uh, or two, a com composite quantum state of two electron or whatever. Uh, uh, it's in the state like here. So zero, zero tensor product zero plus one tensor product one over a square root of two. Uh, the square root of two is just a, a normalization. So let's just forget about it. And the thing is like, you cannot write it as something, some state of the first system tensor product some state of the second system only. So basically it's like doing a factorization in your secondary school, right? So for this one, you cannot factorize it to two things which is very important. And it tells up some very good uh, physics behind it, Did I write it? Yes. So before me, uh, I will tell you the physics, let's formally define the quantum entanglement. So we say uh, composite system phi is, it, is in an entangled state. If and only if the composite quantum state cat phi cannot be written as the tensor product of multiple individual states. Otherwise we call the state cat phi a product state. Right, so if it can be written as like the multiplication of different uh, pro uh different quantum states, then we say uh, as a product state. A very simple example is like, for example, we only consider this part. We only consider like the zero times zero, zero uh, tensor product zero. Then is you can see like they're basically the first system is in cat zero, the second system is also in cat zero, and you tensor product them together as a product state, but not an entangled state. 
Right. So there are several property of an entangled state uh, or a product state. So if the composite system is in the product state, then the measurement of any part of the system will not gain us any information of the other parts. Uh, about quantum information, we'll talk about it probably in two weeks. And you can see, uh, I will show it in like Shannon entropy that this is true. So you are uh, no von Neumann entropy because it's quantum. So uh, we'll show it later. But if the product state, if they're product state, then doing the measurement on the first half of the system will not give you any information of the second half of the system. But other, uh, but otherwise, if the common system is in an entangled state, then the measurement of some part of the system will gain us information on other part of the system, no matter how, like, how many information you gain, but you will gain information. Uh, one of the very simple example is like here. So suppose like cat phi is zero, zero plus one, one. Then you do a measurement on the first qubit, uh, which is the first one before. So uh, say you get a measurement result of zero. Then the uh, state will collapse to cat phi equals zero times zero, right? Zero uh, tends to product zero. And you know, you immediately know that the second qubit is also in cat zero. This is this is what I mean, like um, measuring the first qubit give you information of the second qubit. Or if you measure the first qubit to be cat one, then you immediately know the second qubit is cat one. So this is a very good thing to do quantum information um, and quantum entanglement. So basically, yeah, the, the measurement on part of the system will gain you information on other part of the system. Cool. So uh, last, let's talk about uh, some other thing, like uh, the density operator. So uh, density operators are used for something called the mixed states, uh, which means that the states have classical uncertainty. Uh, and suppose, so uh, what is a mixed state? We'll talk about it like in two minutes. But suppose a quantum system is in one of the, oh, wait, are we talking about it now? Okay, let's, let's talk about it now then. So uh, suppose a quantum system uh, has different probability of being in different pure states. So basically everything we talk about it before uh, this slide are pure states, pure quantum states. And the mixed state is like the system you're in has some probability of being in the first pure state and some probability of being in the second pure state and some probability of being in the third pure state and so on and so forth. So uh, this is pretty a uh, very confusing idea because like uh, a lot of people we confuse it with what the so uh I'll, I'll show you an example it's a bit confusing yeah leave do you have a question no okay no. um my bad yeah so uh the density operator of the system is defined by the equation of rho equals summation of rho i and basically uh cat a uh, cat phi i and bra phi i yeah, right. So um, the density operator is often known as a density matrix. And yeah, basically, oh, I'm already telling them this. OK, uh, I'm probably going a bit too fast, I guess. <laughs> uh, OK, so density matrix are basically matrices, uh, which satisfies some of the properties. And the properties are here. Right, so density operators have several properties. Uh, the first one is the trace condition. So uh, the row, the density matrix row, is a trace class operator with finite and positive trace. Furthermore, we require the trace of the density operator to be one. This is what we require. Uh, and you can show it like um, in the mathematics, which we will not go through very detailedly. And also uh, we have the positivity condition. It's like rho is a positive semi-definite operator. So rho must be greater than zero. This is also what we require for density operator. And, oh, did I write anything? Ah, okay. So it probably is full. Yes. All right. Okay. So with all the knowledge in mind, let's go to like the thing. So actually you see, um, we, the quantum mechanics we use to derive or we are, doing uh, computation in prior to this page are all pure states. But you can see pure states is actually a form, a special form of mixed states, right? So you can just like, for example, the pure state is in cat zero. Then you can say that, oh, the density operator is basically one times zero, zero plus zero times one, one, right? So it's also a mixed state, but a very special kind of mixed state, right? 
So you can always take the probability here to be one. Uh, the probability being in cat zero is one and the probability being cat one is zero, then it becomes a pure state. So actually we can formulate quantum mechanics purely using density operator without using any of the pure states. And how do you do that? It's basically like, for example, the unitary operator in positive two, uh, you can like, when you act a unitary operator on uh, the density operator or density matrix, it's basically following this rule, uh, which is basically the uh, positive two we have mentioned before uh, about the time evolution. And also you can actually do measurements, uh, measurements on the density operator, which represent the mixed states. So a density operator or the measurement result, uh, if, it did, if it did a measurement operator MM on an in initial state of uh, phi i, phi i, it's basically uh, you can do the result similar to what you did for a pure state. And you just summing that up for all the, um, for all the thing. And you can basically arrive the same rule of the measurement rules for a uh, density operator, which is for mixed states. So it's a bit too many math, but what I would like to mention uh, again to emphasize is like density operator is just another way to represent quantum states, uh, but it have a more cap capability than what we have discussing before. We are discussing before only about pure states, which is you know exactly what the state of the quantum system is in. But for the density operator, it can, all, it can no, not only describe pure state, but also mixed states. It's basically, we classically do not which state the uh, quantum system is in. Um, and yeah, it's basically, and the math, just exactly the same. And you can do quantum mechanics purely using density operators and mixed states, yes. So yes. and. Here is like I formally defined pure state and mixed state. So a quantum system whose state cat phi is known exactly is said to be a pure state. In this case, the operator is simple. Uh, sorry, the density operator or the density matrix is simple. Basically phi, uh, phi. Yeah, because you only have one po uh, possibility one of being in cat phi and probability zero of being in other any other states, right? And if a quantum system whose state rho is in a mixed state, and it is said to be a mixture of different pure states in the ensemble of, uh, uh, of rho, sorry, and we do not use a cat symbol to represent it. Um, yeah, because it, it has different probability of being in different pure states. So we are using a density operator to represent it. And the probability is like a pure state satisfied uh, the trace of the density operator square equals to one. While for a mixed state, uh, the density operator squares trace is smaller than one. It's strictly smaller than one. So that's why uh, I will talk about block representation next time, the block sphere. Uh, you will see it more clear, basically, and, and, and the theorem, like uh, density operator, to be sem uh, positive semi-definite. Yeah, so uh, let me just add on one sentence. The row is positive semi-definite uh, for row is greater than zero equal to zero. And row square is also positive semi definite with row square uh, with the trace, sorry, tray class, trace class of row square is also positive semi definite, meaning that row square must be greater or equal to zero with, uh, sorry, uh, row square's trace is smaller than or equal to one with equals to one only for pure states and smaller to one for mixed states, basically, just like what we have mentioned here. Yeah, so, um, Actually, oh, let me see. Okay, cool. Let me see. Okay, actually, uh, some people argue that density operator or mixed states are not physical uh, because in a sense, like you, you should think about p mixed state as like you only have part of the information of a pure state. So like the part of the information means that like the state can be in classically different pure states, classically be in different like different quantum states. Well, but for different possibility of construction of a, a density operator, you can actually construct the same density operator for different probabilities. Uh, sorry, for different ensembles of pure states with different probabilities. So this is what I'm going to show you. Suppose you have a state cat A equals to something here and cat B equals something here. And you have a mixed state with half of a probability of, being, of the state being in cat A and half of probability of the state being in cat B, 
that the density matrix is something like rho equals to half a a plus half b b, which is like after doing the math, you show that it's four or uh, three over four zero zero plus one over four one one, right? But if you just like forgot what a oh sorry, yeah, just like uh do not look at cat a and cat b, just purely look at this like uh density operator is three over four zero zero plus one over one one. It is equivalent to say that the state have a three over four chance of being in cat zero and one over four chance of being in cat one. So actually these two ensembles of pure states give you the same density matrix. Hence, we have the following theorem. It's basically the unitary freedom in ensemble of density matrices. So suppose we have set uh, phi, one, uh, phi i and, sorry, Psi i and phi j generate the same density matrix if and only if you can write phi i to be a summation of some unitary matrix times the psi j. So basically they're, uh, I, don't, I don't know the term, but they they can be transformed to each other. Uh, do you call like homomorphism or isomorphism or something in math? What, what can you transform from what to what? Wait, are we talking about... Uh... Yeah, From so basically, what? if you have two sets of quantum states or two sets of matrices, that uh, uh, matrices it, it, can be uh, It's not really a homomorphism, but it's it's just a transformation. It's not really a homomorphism. Okay. It's not really okay. a homomorphism. It's it can it can be, but it's not really. It's not the, the formal definition. But but it, it okay. it's just a made uh because this this psi is a is a vector or matrix. Uh, it's a wait. Let me see. Vector, right? Because it has an I in yeah, yeah. only one index. So yeah, it, it's just a right. transformation of vector. Um, I guess you can think of it as a homomorph. You can, you can, you can. In principle, right. you can. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, thank you Lee, for like the yeah. But we're not going to use it like for <laughs> for the future. But like, I just want to let you know. Actually, um, uh, you you're having two sets of different pure state. You can generate the same like um density operators. Yes. So, uh, but what we are using more frequently is the reduced density operator. So, um, actually, uh, because like we can use a de uh, density operator to as a descriptive tool for subsystems of a complex system. So, by a reduced operator. So, a reduced operator. Suppose we have physical system A and B, whose state is described by a density operator rho A B. The reduced operator of system A is defined by the partial trace of B. Uh, of the uh, total mixed state rho a b, so the partial trace over system b is defined as here. So suppose you have like um basically you can look the map here. You just like uh using you just like doing a trace on the b part, but not doing a trace on the like a the first system. And this is important because it would shrink down the size of the Hubert space. So originally you have like a two dimensional Hubert space, but after shrink uh, sorry a two system Hubert space, but now you only have a single system Hubert space. So for example, if a Hubert space is like fourth dimension two, like qubits, then originally here, uh, a, a, a1, a2, tensor product b1, b2 is a Hubert space of dimension four, but after doing the partial trace of um, the second half of the system, you shrink it down to a Hubert space of like dimension two, basically, yeah. Uh, we'll use, I think we'll use partial trace when we are doing the quantum information, which is like probably three weeks from now. So yeah. Cool. Last but not least is the uh, Einstein Podovsky Rosen. Yeah. You see like the very good picture here. Uh, the three very esteemed physicists. I just like notified by um, uh, Lee that I should include a picture so we can use a great thumbnail. So this is a thumbnail, I guess. Yeah. So like the three famous physicists who initially do not believe in, I think in 1935, they do not believe that quantum entanglement is true. Uh, so they propose, uh, they actually write a theory. It's like, can quantum mechanics be true or something? Uh, and they want to give a experimental uh, set up to prove that there can't be quantum information or there's some hidden variable that we basically we just don't know that would make quantum information oh, sorry that would make quantum entanglement false so basically they say that when you're like measuring as we mentioned quantum information is like sorry quantum entanglement it's like uh, doing measurement on part of the system will give you information on other part of the system and they're arguing that no this can't be true before we measure the first system we should already we can already pre uh we can already 
uh, produce. No, we can already predict. Yes, we can already predict the second half of the system. And they give a paper of that. And I think Bell did a um, experiment to show that they're wrong. So the joke of the day is Einstein, even uh, Einstein, uh, I mean, like even Einstein failing can be successful, right? So like we're failing as no person, we just fail, we fail the exam or something. But Einstein fail is actually a great remark for like the improvement of physics. So Einstein is actually Einstein, right? Cool. So um, the thing is like, uh, we just, uh, and the detail of their paper and how Bell did a measurement to show that the Bell inequality, uh, it is a quantum mechanics topic, but it's not quite related to quantum information. So uh, for the moment, we just drop it. If you're interested, you can go back to any textbook. They will talk about it uh, for sure. Yeah. So uh, before we talk about the EPR pairs or the Bell states, uh, let's first formally describe what is a qubit. So a qubit is an abstract concept, a concept of a two-dimensional vector space uh, with only two basis vector. So you can think of a qubit as an electron, a spin one half electron, spinning up or down. So you only have two uh, basis vector up or down. And one set of the orthonormal basis is usually referred as the computational basis, uh, which uh, are which there are many representations. You can either use zero, one, up, down, or GE. So GE is like the ground state and the excited state, right? Um, but you can use whatever like you would like to use. So uh, I normally, or like in quantum information, we normally use the cat zero and cat one um, representation of the like basis vectors. And another set of the awful normal basis used is the Fourier basis of the computational basis which is like cat plus and cat minus. So cat plus is actually zero plus one over square root of two and cat minus is zero minus one over square root of two. Yeah, uh, they are two sets of different bases for the same qubits. Yes, for sorry, for the same two dimensional qubit space uh, and qubit lives in that qubit space. This should be a more like formal way to say that. And as we mentioned before, like if you have two entangled qubits or not entangled, it's okay. If you have two qubits, uh, like you consider the composite system of a two qubits and they collectively form a four dimensional vector space. And so there must be four basis vectors, right? Because a four dimensional vector space have four basis vectors. Uh, so one set of the four basis vectors is now called the EPR pair or a Bell state. Uh, I think they can use uh, they can be used interchangeably, but I might not be sure. Like, but normally what we call EPR pairs or Bell states are basically one set of the basis vectors for a four dimensional vector space, and they actually can be written as here. So A represent the first qubit and B represent the second qubit, right? Um, and actually, uh, by writing in zero one basis, it's written like this, but you can also write it in a cat plus and cat minus basis just by doing some simple like change of subjects in your secondary school. You can arrive to something like this. So this is very important because like uh, if two um, qubits are in exactly a EPR pair, form exactly an EPR pair or a Bell state, then we say the two qubits are maximally entangled. Uh, why it is maximally entangled is because the measurement of the first qubit will gain you full information of the measurement of the second qubit. And we we'll showed it. I think we can show it by the von Neumann entropy, which will be introduced probably three, three weeks from now. Yeah, so you got the idea. So bear with me. Uh, we got a lot for the next lectures, next few lectures in the series. Cool. And that's basically what I would like to talk today. Thank you for listening. So the next lecture, we are starting from, uh, we, we basically, we have all the foundation built. We talk about the uh, mathematics foundation. We talk about the quantum mechanics. So next, we will, next lecture, we will actually start quantum computation and quantum information. So uh, we were discussing the quantum circuits. So we'll talk about the quantum operators, something related to today, uh, what we we'll talk about today, the single qubit and multiple qubit quantum, <coughs> quantum gates, and probably something about computation and complexity and stuff. So I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you. Okay, uh, great job, Simba. I have some uh, minor questions, I guess. Yes, Can you go yes, back yes. to POS? I can't remember, I can't even remember the POS in quantum. Just go back to, I think, POS 2? Or maybe yeah. one, I can't remember. 
stay space or uh, uh, go down one. The one where they say uh the permission operators all all operators must be permission. I think uh I can't remember. Ah, uh, is, is one? that one or two? I can't remember. Uh, no, uh, this is actually not a postulate. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. That's why I was gonna I was gonna say if it's not a postulate, then I'm completely wrong because I've heard people you can do. Uh, it's not the standard way to do it, but I heard you can do quantum mechanics not using Hermitian operators, which is very difficult, but you know, oh. I heard you can do it. It's called non-Hermitian quantum mechanics. And I heard about it like two months ago, but like, but I, I've never attempted to learn it because I thought it would be make quantum mechanics a lot more difficult, right? Yeah, it seems- Yeah, <laughs> I, go... I'm not familiarized with that, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. No, I'm, just, I'm just saying, that, like I, I've seen it before, that's why. There's another thing that I have to say about the when you gave the example of the hydrogen atom. Um, yeah. Yes, it's right. You can use QFT to derive it. But actually, a lot of ways that we do derive it is using um, time in the, uh, time dependent perturbation theory. So you can oh. derive the relativistic corrections for the hydrogen atom. Um, another way you can do it is even more difficult is using if you use QFT. Um, I, I learned this like a week ago when you told me that you were going to talk about uh, when you when you told me that you were going to learn QFT uh, in, right. in your university. <laughs> I, I, I read about it uh, to to actually do it in QFT is easy, I guess easier. It depends on your taste, right? If you do it in uh, using perturbation theory, you need to do matrix operations, which is sometimes not so easy. But if you do it in QFT, you have to solve uh, differential equations. I don't know which, I don't know. It depends on your preference, right? It depends which yeah, one right. you do is easier. Um, I think if you want to do it, I can show it next time, but it's like to do it, you have to use something called Frobenius' method. It's basically the same as power series in um in when you derive the quantum harmonic oscillator. And then you have to right. do hydro hypergeometric functions, which is really ugly as well. So I'm not gonna discuss it too right, much. Right, right. There was another thing that I wanted to talk about. Um I can't remember. Okay. Oh, remember the one where we said we made a mistake about the the probability? I I've resolved the issue. Um uh oh, the, okay. the it's uh, your uh, your your notes is correct. You written you wrote it down correctly. Okay, and, so the, the correct then. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Go. I don't know where it is actually. The part of three, right? I think. Yeah. Here. No. No. Yeah. Uh. The reason why is because the projection operator when acting on psi. Um. For, okay. There's two ways to look at it. The projection operator is a unitary operator, which means it preserves yeah. length. So basically, it preserves the probability here. So because psi, uh, psi ket. Sorry, bra psi ket psi is basically the probability, uh, the probability, right? But mm -hmm. in for unitary operators, they always preserve length. So basically, yeah. this is also a probability. Another way you can think of it is that since um projection of m on psi, let's say m is some state, um, some state that psi has, right? So uh, mm -hmm. it will extract the coefficient from the state, um, from the state, uh, m. And then what happens once you extract that coefficient when you when you cat it with the bra of psi, it will basically yeah. produce the ortho. It will basically do cat m, cat, uh, bra m, cat m, and then the and then you have the coefficient squared, which is exactly the same as the probability density. So this is correct. Right, this right. is completely correct. Oh, there is one. Good. Yeah, there's one more thing. Yeah, like you said to the Oxford professor, just trust what you have written. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, there's <laughs> one last thing that I wanted to. Ask. Uh, you did not discuss the uh, uh, what's it called? How we determine whether two states are entangled yet, right? You have have you discussed that yet? I I I know that you uh, mentioned it. No, no. Okay, um, then we'll actually, we'll talk about it. Uh, do yeah. you know how this? Do you know I, I know you I I know because we talked about it before. But the thing is, if you haven't talked, if you haven't talked about it here, we'll save this discussion for next time. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Uh, yeah. could you like briefly this? I'll probably can stop the video first and no, yeah. no, it's all right, it's all right. I mean, I can keep it running, and if it's if it's too long, I can just cut it. Right? It's like yeah, right. you told it's me that terrible. you have to determine the partial trace, which you have already mentioned. Uh, that one I don't think is correct, cause like uh, no, I correct? think it's fine. I think it's fine. I think it's you can do it, but it's uh, I'm thinking whether it's, it is correct or not. I think I'm sure it is. I'm sure. More commonly sure. way is to use the uh. For Neumann entropy to calculate that that also works right. There, there are many right, ways right. to do it. Like the way if we were going to talk about it, I was going to say that you can write the basis as non-coordinate form, and then you can see yeah. whether it, it's a. Uh, okay. But that's another way to do it, right? I think your way is more like probabilistic and yeah, and right, right. more like linear algebra. My way is more okay. kind of 
geometry and stuff. And mm -hmm. what was I going to say? Composite states. Ah, there's there's not nothing. That's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's do you have anything to add? Nothing. Um, I don't think so. Because next okay. next week would be a little bit easier because we will talk about quantum com like basis of quantum computation. So that would be okay. Easier. Okay. So uh, okay. So uh, I think we'll end it here and uh, see yeah. you guys in the next video. Bye. Yeah. Bye.